Hello, everybody. So today, what are we going to talk about? So we're going to talk about QA tools. So how can you put together tools um, to help your consultants or even your in-house teams get you the models you want? Let's say you already have some requirements or you already have what you want out of models, at least partially. So what tools can you provide to them to help them meet those requirements with it? So I'm going to talk about um, quite a few things here. I'll list them here in a second. A little bit about me, so I'm, I'm an architect by training and licensure. Um, I am still very involved in the architecture community. I'm the president of our local AIA chapter in Northern Virginia as well. I've been in the industry, next year will be 25 years for me. It's been a while. But I've been doing consulting now for 18 of those years and, and really enjoy it on the technology side. So I've been working with architects, engineers, contractors, facility managers, owners, uh, helping them implement technologies and, of course, focused on BIM during that time. So let's talk about quality assurance. Um, if you were at the pre-conference, and I recognize some faces there, we spent a lot of time talking about quality control, about, all right, somebody just gave you a model that you asked for. How do you check that they did it right? But this session is all about what tools can you give them to make sure they do it right from the beginning in it. So, these are the tools that you can provide to your teams. It doesn't matter if they're your in-house teams. It doesn't matter if they're your outside consultants. What can you put together to make it easier for them? And I'm gonna get very specific in this session when it comes to that. I welcome questions throughout. I'll try and manage those as we do it. Otherwise, I'm around the whole week if you wanna come talk to me about specifics afterwards. So these are the seven items I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to talk about component families, and what you want to consider with those. I'm going to talk about templates, in particular a Revit template. And again, what do you want to consider with a Revit template, not just, oh, give them a Revit template because there, there are problems with that. Um, I'm going to talk about classification manager databases. So how can you give them a database of values that you want them to choose from when they're populating your models? I'm going to talk about Kobe extension configuration. So when you want a data deliverable, how can you give them already a configuration file so that they're easily exporting in a Kobe format what you want. I'm going to talk a little bit about BIM 360 and how that can help you from an owner standpoint. And then, of course, no good set of QA tools can exist without good BIM requirements and a BIM execution plan. So I'm going to talk about some tips and tricks, some best practices for those things that we've learned over the years building these for owners. So let's jump in and let's talk about Revit component families. Um, so those of you who are new or newer to Revit, family is kind of a weird term, right? And, and Revit has this hierarchy. So there's families, and the families are, are the definitions of the components, and then there are types within them, and then the instances are what you actually place, the individual instances within it. What you don't want to do as an owner is probably build this massive library of families to provide to your consultants or to your in-house teams. You want to be very selective on what you're building because they're extremely time consuming to do and things are always changing. So some recommendations for this would be um, you may have some non-manufacturer specific items that you actually want to um, provide. You know, receptacles are a perfect example. You don't go and look for a specific manufacturer of a receptacle, but you may have a standard, even a CAD standard of how those look on your construction documents or the plans that you receive. So you may want to provide those. Exit signs are another way. A lot of electrical symbols, people get kind of crazy about what that symbol looks like. I, I was just working with um, um, a government agency, uh, a big government agency, and they were getting a set of models back for one particular building, even though they have four buildings going on. And for whatever reason, the standard for that electrical engineer was to show the receptacle, not with the two lines coming out of the wall to the circle, but the other way around, the circle touching the wall and the two lines coming out, which probably is technically more correct, but just nobody does it that way. And so th there was this whole hoopla about just the symbol being turned around. So um, they provided them with, with the way that they wanted it done. The other thing you may want to focus on for your libraries are these items that are across buildings. So if it's specific to one building, a piece of equipment or a component, you probably don't want to build that in your library. But if you have you know, standardized doors that you're using across all of your buildings, then that might be a good thing to build as part of a library to give out to consultants or to your in-house teams. 
Lighting fixtures are another example. Keep in mind that the goal of a model is to, for you as an owner, is not to have a fabrication level model, right? People have been talking about operations model or FIM models, right? The goal of a FIM model is, is twofold. It's to get the data out to populate my space management system, my asset management system, but to use that model as your background for renovation projects going forward. And if that background is already at an LOD of 400, meaning it's already at a fabrication level, it's really hard to use that as a background, right? As an example, I want a model that just has one giant floor slab per floor. I don't want it broken up into the pores like the construction model might have because that's really hard to manipulate later on, right? So those are some examples of why you'd want to have kind of lower level um, items, components inside of your um, models themselves. And then of course, if you have very specialized items, you know, many universities in here have a hospital on campus, right? They might have a medical school attached to it, and hospitals have very specialized equipment. So you might want to provide libraries for that particular um, item. Classrooms, you know, AV equipment in classrooms, again, those are typically bought in bulk for many buildings, so it might be nice to have those as a library to give to your, to give to your consultants as well. Let's talk about a Revit template in general. So I purposely named the last part, this first session, as Revit component families. There are two kind of main categories of families. There are component families and there are system families. Anybody know the difference between them? Anybody tell me the difference? Sarah, I see your hand going up. Uh, a wall is Yes, those are very good examples. The, the big difference, Rick, did you want to add? The component family can be exported and shared, the system families can't. They can only reside inside the project. Yeah, so that's the, that's the key from a behavior standpoint, is that component families can be their own individual files. Just like in AutoCAD, you can export a block to its own DWG and insert that block later on. Uh, component families work the same way in Revit. They are .RFA extensions, Revit families, and you can insert them in any project. But a system family, like a wall, cannot exist as its own separate file. It has to be in a project, which means if I want to share system families across projects, then I need a host for that. I need a project host for that. That's why a lot of people have templates, because it already has that stuff in it. Um, so a, a template can hold lots of things. So first off, a Revit template can hold settings that you may um, want to use and think again from a CAD standards perspective. You know, we always think about Revit um, models as focused on the items that are actually going to be built, but that database, that Revit database, has other things in it to keep that database going, including things to be able to export it to CAD files, right? So fill patterns, line weights, um, line styles, object styles, these are all things that are unique to a Revit database but it's important that you as an owner have standards for those things so that as people are making models, all your models are the same way and can be utilized the same way. This is a little foreshadowing to later on, but I recommend everybody in their BIM requirements actually have a section on model standards, which is what this stuff would be. Most people just have it for built elements. Um, views and organization. How many of you have received a Revit model and there were 1,200 views in it and you have no idea which view to open up just to look at a floor plan, right? Everyone, because the architect just loves to throw views in there and they have everybody's initials on them and they're all organized weird and you don't know what's happening with them. The good news is, is that views don't hold any model geometry, meaning if I delete every view in the model, I have not lost the model. I've just lost that view of that model. And the only thing that's sitting on a view is usually annotations. So I might have some tags on there, I might have some dimensions on there, but I didn't lose the information in the tags because the information is in the modeled element. I can just re-tag it all I want, still get that information. So often it's nice to have a template that holds what standard views you would want at the end. And again, put in your BIM requirements 
When you hand over a model at the end at handover, I only want these 10 views in it. To see examples of those views, look at our template. They're sitting in there. You can see it. And they already have their view templates assigned to them. And the view template is how you tell it what to show and what not to show. There are a lot of other settings in there, but um, that's a key way to, to standardize your models as you get them. Again, keeping in mind that when I get a model, I don't want the model because it's a rendition of the construction documents. I want the model as the as-built condition that I can use as a background moving forward. So I don't need sheets in it. I don't need any of that stuff, really. You might have your own legends and schedules that you want to put in there because you like, you like to see the information a certain way because maybe you report on that. And so a Revit template has to host those things. You can't have it somewhere else. And then we, we started to talk about system families. So there are system families based on the discipline in there that you can't have in separate files. They have to exist in a project template. Now, even though you have a, a Revit template, there's some psychology behind a Revit template. You will never be able to hand over a template to one of your consultants and say, hey, use this as your template when you build your building for me. All of them will, will not do that. They might tell you they're going to do it. They're not going to do it because they have their own templates. They've been developing for years and years and years. They have their own workflows with it. So there's really no point in you actually making a Revit template. And it's really just in the name. Instead, what we often do is instead of giving them as this RTE, this Revit template file, we actually just give them a Revit project and we'll call it either a showcase file or a warehouse file. Right? Here's a repository of all of our standards and you guys can just import those into your template. And eventually they don't even realize that they've overwritten their template with your template from all those imports. Right? And it makes, their, makes your life a lot easier, helps them standardize. It, gets, it breaks down that wall of them using your template when they're not. They're using their template and just overriding their settings with your settings. And so that's a, that's a way to deal with that. If you think of it as a warehouse or a showcase file then too, then you don't have to manage any component families you've created. Instead of me handing them a template and all these RFA files in a folder and trying to exchange all these files, I could just insert all of those families in the middle of my showcase file and just hand it over to them and say, here's everything. Here's everything that we have. You guys can use this to build this project to meet our standards because we already have it in here. And of course, all these components will already have the parameters assigned to them that you want ready for them to complete the data in them to make their life easier. It might be a big file, but who cares? It's still smaller than the end project they're going to give you. It's a lot easier. Yeah. Well, you're not going to overwrite your showcase file. So if they send you a model that they've done in their template, you could certainly import all of your stuff and overwrite their settings in that model. But you want to put the onus on them, right? You don't want to be spending time overwriting our template if you've already required all of these things in your BIM requirements. So ideally, you want to hand this to them and say, you guys override it before you send it to us. So it would be like part of the guidelines for BIM. Exactly. Okay. Yep. I'm going to show you an example here in a little bit of what you can put in your BIM requirements to help them meet the, all the standards that you have in your showcase file or your warehouse file. Okay. Let's talk about classification managers. So um, if you, again, were here yesterday, the pre-conference, we spent a lot of time talking about the classification manager. The whole purpose of the classification manager is to provide a tool inside of Revit to give people a list of values to pick from to assign to things. Instead of letting them type it in how they want and everybody makes mistakes, then instead they can just pick from the list and say, assign that data to this, to this parameter, assign that data to this parameter. So Chuck made a really good example of this. He had a, a, a file once where one person had named it storage it was a room, and they named it storage and spelled out, spelled out storage. And then the next one did S-T-O-R, period, and the other one did S-T-R-G. S-T-O-R. Okay, S-T-O-R without the period, and then the other one just called it closet, right? So 
same model had storage listed four different ways. If they had a, a very quick database, which is just based on an Excel file to choose from, then they all would have been the standard, standard way across the board. That's just one example, right? The, many of you use the, the FICOM or FICOM, we had a whole debate about how it's pronounced, um, database to categorize your rooms and spaces in your models. That is built into the classification manager. This is a free tool. You download it, and all of a sudden, the, the FICOM FICOM database is sitting in there, and you can start assigning it to all your rooms. And more importantly, your consultants can start assigning it at the same time, right? So what a classification manager will allow you to do is to not only give them the classification systems you're using, uniformat, master format, omniclass table 21, 22, or whatever, you can also give them pick lists pre-built values in tables to say, when you're adding data to these elements, here's a table to choose from all the values. So you don't have to think about it. You don't have to type it in. You don't have to worry about, oh, should I do it all uppercase or lowercase? Should I add a period? Not, right? And so that's a great way to hand them an Excel file and say, here's your, Excel, here's your classification manager database, and it has tabs for all the different things that we want to standardize, and it's free software. They just plug it right in and go. Right, so some examples. Um, obviously, for the classification systems, you can use the standard ones. This comes with the software out of the box. But you may create pick lists for you know, fire ratings. Make sure I type in fire rating the same way. Space room types. I just talk about the FICM FICM database, but you might have your own standard way of categorizing rooms. Um, this is a big one that I think every owner should have, which is a list of equipment subcategories. So, Sarah, did you have a question real quick? My Well, you can customize that to point to whatever parameters you want, and they could customize the point to whatever parameters they want, and when you're doing a data deliverable, you could point it back to your parameters. So there, there doesn't need to be any pushback. Um, if they know how to use it, they can, they can make it conform to their standards, and you can easily convert back to your standards in one click. That's a good question, though. So this whole thing of equipment subcategories, if you've used Revit before, you know that Revit has family categories. So that might be a door, that might be a wall, that might be a window, that might be mechanical equipment or electrical equipment. Revit doesn't go below that, right? So a boiler, a chiller, a pump, an air handling unit are all mechanical equipment to Revit. Of course, all of your O&M systems break it down into boiler and chiller and air handling unit, VAV box and shutoff valves and all these things. So you have to tell Revit what the subcategory is and what better way to do that than to have a database of it in Excel, just a list of it in Excel that you can hand to them and say, whenever you're assigning equipment, just assign it a subcategory. Here's the list you can choose from. And that the classification manager will, will allow you to have kind of two values. It could have the, the name, air handling unit, and it can have the abbreviation AHU. And those are your standards for that. And that way when they build a schedule, it's AHU 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So every owner needs to have an equipment subcategory database until Revit can kind of resolve that, that issue. Anybody dealt with this? Just about every O&M system has its own list of subcategories so you can align it with the system, whether you're using FM Systems or Arcabus or Maximo or whatever you're using for your O&M. So the next one is Kobe Extension. So Again, my, my whole purpose of, of a BIM handover at the end of design and construction to get into operations is I want a model to do three things. I want a model to use as a background for future renovation projects. So I want it at a, essentially LOD 300 that I can use and move forward with it, make it my master file. I want space data pulled out of it so that I can plug that into my space management system, and many space management systems will connect directly with your Revit model. Um, a few of them will cr connect in a hybrid environment, do half Revit, half CAD, all in the same environment, and be able to pull from that. It's really the ideal situation for moving forward from here. And then the, the third thing is I want a, a data deliverable for my O&M system. All those pieces of equipment, all those managed assets, I want a data deliverable for that. So. 
that can be a challenge, and, and so much so that you know, a dozen years ago, the Army Corps of Engineers said, wait, everybody hold up. The, everybody's making BIM models with all this data in it, but everybody has this O&M system. How do we get that data in a standardized way to the O&M system? And, and therein, Kobe was born, right? Construction Operations Building Information Exchange. So this, all this is is a standardized data format that's usually delivered in a spreadsheet. But all of the O&M systems, the FM systems, the WebTMA, the ARCABUS, all of them understand this format. So if I can export it from Revit into this format, then they can all import it, and I don't have to spend a lot of time configuring that or doing data hooks, whatever. This is a short-term fix, right? Kobe's a short-term fix. Until Revit models and O&M databases just talk with each other back and forth, we're getting much closer to that. Some systems can do that. Um, but until then, you need a data deliverable, and Kobe is probably the best way to handle that with it. So what does that mean to you? That means that if you want a data deliverable in the Kobe format, you install the free Kobe extension for Revit, and then people can work in Revit, and when you're ready, they can export to the Kobe standardized format, and you're ready to import into your O&M system. And the, the goal then is that there is no downtime between that final model and when your O&M system is up and running for your building engineers to be able to utilize. So the Kobe extension actually has some settings in it. Right? They, they default to what Kobe wants, but Kobe does not um, call out specific fields of data that you may want. Right? It may not call out the voltage, or it may not call out um, the flow of a particular system into into a pump and out of a pump, right? Those might be important fields of data that you want. Kobe doesn't call that out, but you have that in your BIM requirements. Hey, I need these pieces of data so that I can manage my facility. Um, I'm gonna put them in, in the model in a Kobe format, and then you can configure the, the Kobe extension to remember those fields of data and export them to the Kobe spreadsheet for you. So there's a configuration in here in Kobe um, that's called attributes, and that's what that's for. So I can go in there and say, hey, I've added these parameters to my equipment. These are the parameters of data I want. This one says um, airflow, um, circuit number, chilled water flow, right? Whatever you want as, as your pieces of data, and this is for mechanical equipment. I can configure the Kobe extension to say, always export that data to the attributes tab so that when I import it, it knows exactly where to go into my own m system. You can save these settings to an XML file, a nondescript open source XML file, and hand it out to whoever you want. Say, Here, here's our standard settings for Kobe. Plug that into the Kobe extension, fill in this data, and we'll export it and be ready to go at the end of handover. How many people did I lose on that section? <laughs> it's complicated stuff, but we can help you with that. It's not too bad. Okay, I want to talk about BIM 360 a little bit. And you've probably heard about BIM 360 throughout, throughout this conference. So what is it? So this is Autodesk's all-in, right? So Autodesk, as pretty much every software manufacturer in the world right now, the Microsofts, the Adobes, um, any HR system, most of your O&M systems, if you think of WebTMA, are SaaS-based, right? It's software as a service. You um, hold your data in their private cloud, and you get that data, and you, you manipulate it, and you don't have to install software, right? So Autodesk is doing the same thing for the whole design and construction industry. They have the BIM 360 solution, and it's a lot of different modules as part of that. So first off, it, just to talk a little bit about some of these modules, right? It's a whole document management system. There are lots of document management systems, but there are not a lot of document management systems that are tied directly with your Autodesk products, AutoCAD and Revit, or have specific spots just for submittals, issuances, RFIs, right? All of that is just built into that document management system, and you can have full control over who gets what when but it also supports all the other documents you're dealing with, whether it's PDFs or Word documents or Excel files or, or pictures or whatever. Um, has design collaboration. 
This has um, come a long way. Gone are the days of design collaboration means your architects and engineers are working on the same model at the same time, and they're all fighting with each other because the electrical engineer just put in some lights and the architect decided to erase that, that ceiling and put in a different ceiling because they moved the wall half a, half a foot, right? Gone are those days because now what happens is um, in design collaboration, it allows them to designate what is a, um, the current background, even though I've moved past that, so that you're not stepping on each other's feet. It, it works really well that way. So that design collaboration allows you as the owner insight into what's happening during design, um, but allows them to work together in a friendly environment as much as architects and engineers can. Um, so glue is essentially the clash coordination in the cloud. This allows you to um, see your models and mark them up and find clashes. And, and from an owner's perspective, you just open up a browser and I can see the full model and I can go in and make notes um, and, and know what's going on and I don't need a high-end computer to do that. Right? I don't need to run software to do that, and that's pretty impressive. Um, build is all about in the field stuff. So um, can I um, go through any checklists I have, maybe safety checklists or even OSHA checklists? Um, can, I, can I go through punch lists? Can I gather the data on the equipment for commissioning? Like all of that is part of build, which is you know, mostly iPad-based, but feeds back to the model itself. They also have some other ones, plan, layout, ops, um, you know, project planning. Um, layout is pretty cool. It'll actually put the BIM model into a total station, and so your contractors don't have to snap chalk lines anymore. They can, it will actually just project the lasers from the total station where they need to lay stuff out directly from the BIM model. You know, shoot a laser point, and here's where I have to put that hanger, or shoot a line, and here's where I have to put the stud for that wall, the base stud for that wall. Right, pretty cool stuff. And then ops, you, you actually saw this during the Spark sessions. Mark um, went over how ops can do the wayfinding with the Apple Maps and how it can do very quick um, work order management. All of that is part of the BIM 360 team. Why is that important to you as an owner? So I have my Utopia picture here, but so so often I work with owners who are working on a project and the contractor says, oh, we're using XYZ software to manage this project. Here's your login. Here's how you can see everything. And you're very happy, right? And then the next contractor's like, well, we use um, ABC software to do that. Here's your login. Here's how you handle it. And now you as a project manager have to remember how to handle three or four or five different systems to manage the different projects that you're managing, right? What if you controlled all that. What if you said, oh, no, 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 we're not going to use XYZ or ABC. I'm going to use BIM 360. I'm going to invite you. I'm going to give you the, the, the credentials you need to handle it. But now I only have to remember one way to handle all my projects, right? I don't have to remember all these different ways. And more importantly, I have access to the data 24-7, not, hey, let me send you an email. I wanted to look at those latest drawings, that latest model. Can you get back to me on that? And they may, or may not get back to you that day or later on. Right, so put yourself in control as the owner. There are more and more owners doing this right now. Um, we saw, I mean, a couple years ago, Carolina Health Systems does this. They actually divvy out the BIM 360 licenses to their team so that they always have control of that data. I mean, what happens when litigation starts on a project? I'm sure many of you have been involved with that and suddenly, hey, I wanna see the data on that. Well, let me get back to you on it, right? What if you had control? over that. Um, some of you may be aware, but the, the UK government mandates BIM now, right? The US government does not, but the UK government mandates BIM on their projects. And the current state of BIM in the UK is, for every project, you have to have a common data environment. You have to have a central location that houses all the data for this project that is BIM enabled. And they use that CDE term all the time. It's a great term. And really, that's what BIM 360 is. It's your common data environment so that I can have everything related to that project that I can access at any time with it. So the best QA tool is a set of clear BIM requirements, right? How many in here have a set of BIM requirements or BIM standards? 
for their organization. A few, I see a few hands. No worries, I can help you with that, come talk to me. Um, how do people know what to give you in a standardized way if you haven't documented it? Now keep in mind that a, a set of BIM requirements is really meant to be a contract document. It's really meant to be an addendum to your design and construction contract. It's really meant to say, you're gonna do this project for me. By the way, we're gonna follow a BIM process. To know what that BIM process means and what you're gonna deliver to us, go see attachment F to the contract called our BIM requirements, or whatever it is, right? It doesn't compete with your design and construction contract. It adds to it for a project where you want BIM. And the whole point of a set of BIM requirements is to define the processes you want them to follow and the deliverables you want from it. That's all it is. That can be complicated sometimes, but that's really the purpose of a BIM requirements. A BIM requirements is meant to be an overarching document to apply to all of your BIM projects, no matter what scale they're at. Even if I'm just gonna do a quick renovation of a lobby of one of my buildings versus a new $300 million student center, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, any of those I could designate as BIM, here's the requirements to follow. Not to be confused with the BIM execution plan, which I'll get to here in a second. There are some definite um, best practices for a BIM requirements document. So the first is you don't want redundancy, right? If you're already saying it in your standard design and construction contract, don't say it again in your BIM requirements. That's pretty obvious. You want to define these terms. These terms trip people up everywhere I go. As built versus as existing versus record. They are not the same things. They are different and they have different meanings. But many people lump those together or maybe lump two of the three together. And it can be very confusing when you are using one term and your contractor thinks you mean something else. So spell them out on exactly what that means. I heard in a previous session that they're, because they're a state university, they're not allowed to call out specific authoring software, specific software to get their BIM models. So they don't do that, but everyone knows. That Mike did not want to be with me. It made a run for it. That's going to be an edit spot. They're going to think I passed out in the video. So uh, we run into this all the time. If you can't put in what the authoring software needs to be in the BIM requirements, fine, make it an option in the BIM execution plan. In my BIM execution plan, call out what software you're using and just have people write in Revit every time, right? 85% of the world is using Revit to make BIM models. Um, the last thing you want is models in a whole bunch of different formats and you have to figure out how to translate all that data. Right. 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 Your, your, your BIM requirements are documenting the results. They're not prescriptive on the steps to get to those results. Mm -hmm. Right. But IFC is not going to cut it, by the way. So don't ask for that, to be honest. Um, <clears throat> Another thing that I see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about these two things in tandem. So typically BIM requirements documents lay out um, process and submissions based on one or two ways. One way is to say, here are typical project types. And at a, at a high level that might be interior renovations or big capital projects, right? At a, at a minimum I have those two different project types. And those could vary widely. Some of you have multiple um, spectrum of those different types. It might be dependent on size or cost. It might depend on how it's getting funded um, if you're a state university. There are, there are lots of different ways on how you control that and, and that works just fine. The one thing I, I would say is, is to add as a project type is this whole as existing project type, meaning I'm not actually doing a design and construction project. I just have a building over here that I want you to turn into a BIM model. How are you supposed to do that well, here are the steps to walk through. 
right? And so that's a good project type to have if you're setting up your BIM requirements to match your different projects. That way, if I'm doing a capital construction project, I might have BIM submission milestones at the end of SD, maybe halfway through DD, the end of DD, maybe three times through CD, and then at handover, right? Or whatever it is. And those are your milestones. And each milestone you'll say, well, at this milestone, I expect a model at this LOD in general, but look at our BEP for specific items. And at this milestone, maybe I want a, a, a Kobe drop really quick just to see that you guys are on track. That's not a final one. So those are the types of things that you would see as your submissions, and, and that works really well. So if you're gonna do that, do an as existing project type. Now the other way to do this is just through milestones. So often we run into owners who have lots of weird project types, and sometimes they vary, right? So what we do for those instead is in the BIM requirements, you say, all right, here are milestone submissions. End of SD, end of DD, two through CD, or any time in CD, and then one at pre-construction and one at handover. Those are my submission milestones. When I get to the BEP, the BIM execution plan, I'll choose which ones I'm using for this project, right? I'll just check the boxes and say, these are the different submissions I'm gonna use for this project. Look at the BIM requirements for what's expected at each submission for those milestones. And that is sometimes an easier way too, because then you can mix and match all different project types and what you want from them. You might even break it down just into deliverables, right? I want preliminary Kobe deliverable. I want final Kobe deliverable. I want um, low LOD models. I want my final LOD model. Maybe those are your submission types, your submission milestones, and they're defined in your BIM requirements. And then in your BEP, you say, all right, at this, in this project, I need that deliverable at this point, that deliverable at this point, right? There are different ways of organizing it depending on what's best for your organization. I mentioned it before, this first bullet point. I, I never see this. Um, we put them in our BIM requirements every time is modeling standards, right? Think of these as CAD standards. You want that model in a certain format and you want it to, to follow the standards that you have, so put it in your BIM requirements. Don't just call out, oh, I want the equipment done this way and the doors and windows done this way. I need line styles done this way. I need the browser organization done this way. I expect these view templates in it, right? Go get my showcase file to get all those standards. Just follow what's in the showcase file, right? That's an easier way to do that. In fact, often, what we'll do is for modeling standards is we'll actually use a modified LOD system. Instead of LOD 100, 200, 300, 400, for modeling standards, we just use two variables. We use interim and final. So interim is throughout the project, uh, I want you, whenever you're delivering models throughout the project till final handover, it can, you can do all this stuff. So for an example, phases, right? I can, I can assign phases in a Revit model. Maybe it's phase one, two, three, four. Maybe it's just existing and new construction. Whatever it is, I can have multiple phases at interim submissions, but at final submission, you better set everything to be as existing, right? There's no more new construction, you're done. So hand me the model with everything set to that. Design options are another example. I might have all these design options as I'm moving through it, but at final submission, you better um, promote all of those to what the final one was and get rid of anything that you, we didn't choose as a design option. I'll show you an example here in a second. I'll show you an example right now. Why not? Um, so here's a sample BIM requirements document. Let me see here. Naming conventions, settings, project location. I was going to go look at... So in this case, in this document, <coughs> fill patterns, whether it's an interim submission, whether it's a final submission, will just match whatever we have in our Revit showcase file. Right, that, that's one way to call this out. Line styles, doesn't matter. If I move down to some of these other settings in here, phases and demolition, right? So you're allowed to use whatever phases you want during interim submissions, but at final submission, all the, all the elements will be assigned to either existing or new construction. Right? I'm just calling that out. 
within it. And this is a great way to handle that. So in your, your element responsibilities table in the BEP, just like you would call out LOD 100, 200, 300, 400 for actual built elements, you'll have another table down below that says either interim or final to match this and who's responsible for it, right? Thank you. That looks something like this. So here's, a, here's an element uh, responsibility table. As I scroll down, you'll see we have all the settings down below. So that's an interim submission. Here's an interim submission. Everybody on the project, because they have their own models, are responsible for doing the interim until I get over to you know, my final submission. Everybody has to do it. It's a little redundant, but it's nice to know that people are actually calling that out and signing off on it. The other thing that's really good to have in a BIM requirements is a, um, uh, essentially your model diagram, what you expect the models to do. So through design and construction into operations, what do those models look like? Where do they go? This is a particular diagram, it doesn't have to be your diagram, um, but certainly this is something you wanna call out so that you know who, who's doing what when, where the models start from and go to. Couple other be um, best practices. If you've ever seen me present, you know I'm very bullish on LOD not being one number. I don't like LOD being one number because if you look at this, if I look at schematic design and design development through construction into operations, the graphics and data on the elements are not in alignment. So how can I say LOD 300 when graphics and data are gonna be different? So often our BIM requirements will say LOD 300C. So 300 is the graphics part and C is the data part. And that way you can control what you want. Because when I get an operations model, I probably want 200D. That's really what I want for an operations model. So you can define that a little bit better and you should in your BIM requirements. You should also be very clear what not to model so you don't get these giant bloated models, right? So that every door doesn't have all the hardware modeled on it because I don't really need that to operate my building. I just need a parameter that tells me the hardware set. And then the other thing we often do is when you're creating your own custom data fields in the model that you want people to populate for Kobe or whatever, is we actually put in the name of that parameter the responsible party. So we might have A, E, C, and CX parameters. So that it's very clear, oh, the architect is responsible for this data, the engineer is responsible for this, the contractor for this, the commissioning agent for this. And there's no questions later on. Wrapping up, BIM execution plan. Um, I, I showed you already a view of it. Again, this is a this BIM execution plan template is a little different than what you've seen. Often what you'll see is that there might be a different tab for interior renovation projects or a different tab for capital construction projects and the element responsibility tables would be in there. What we tend to do is just build these column groups based on the submission. So there's the initial planning, here's 100% SD Right? And I can scroll over, but the nice thing is you can then um, collapse these groups so that people can just focus on what the next submission is and not have to move around this giant table all the time. And also, we organize it this way by discipline. So structure knows all of their information. Architecture and interior design know theirs. Mechanical knows theirs. Electrical knows theirs. And this way, if I'm not worried about that, I can collapse that out of the way and just focus on what I need to do for the next one because managing these spreadsheets are a nightmare, but you can um, control a little bit better with some uh, great formatting in, in Excel, which will save the world, by the way. Excel will save the world. That's my theory. Okay. I talked a lot. It's at 3 o'clock. If anybody, well, let, anybody have some quick questions right now? You, well, you Samuel. Put a parameter quick in there. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I qualified it. Uh, so you sold me. How do I go back after this conference and sell my leadership that just totally, like, the conversation evolves when I, I, I barely understand this stuff. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this, this sounds great. We should be doing this. 
you know, my boss is an architect, right. old school architect, and it's like, ah, oh, we'll leave that to the consultant. And I'm like, oh, well, I guess we don't want to, you know, say what we want. It's just left to the wild, wild, wild west. And I have no idea how to get them right. on board, or at least get one champion that <laughs> I'm hearing about. Well, certainly let's talk after this, but the whole point of QA tools is you set them up up front and then your consultants use them throughout every project moving forward, right? A little bit of upfront investment pays over and over again for you to get standardized data down the road. PJ, can I jump in on that? Yes, sir. One of the benefits you have being in the higher ed space and how much organizations will share with each other, I would highly recommend you talk to like Devon at Western Michigan. Pete Strauss is, is an incredible advocate for what they're, and he has ROI slides that he shows other owners in higher ed space on what they've achieved in the way of ROI on their investment. Yeah, uh, I've been there, I've done that, and they ignore me. All right, so it's like, okay. all right, here's the ROI. I've talked to all these schools and they're all doing this great stuff. The industry is there, we're getting all our buildings this way, why aren't we doing this? And it's like, ah, too expensive, or we're too small, or whatever. And it's just like, but if they had a call with Pete, your leadership had a call with Pete, his leadership at that university, and Pete says, look what we did for ROI. That message comes across a lot different than from you giving it. I mean, I, I see it all the time. When I worked as an architect, when I went to the principal of the firm and said, we should do this, I was totally ignored. I then became an architecture consultant, and I would go back to the same firms, talk to the same principal, and they're like, oh yeah, that's a really good idea. You should do that, <laughs> right? It's the Bob's effect from office space where they come in and, and, and suddenly they're an authority figure. <laughs> I know. So let me, let me stop it there. If anybody has more questions, come talk to me. Um, but I, I want to be cognizant of your time. Please come up and, and, and ask more questions if you have it. Thank you, everybody.